Hello and greetings from Blackbird Studio EE. I'm Mark Rubel, uh, Director of Education at the Blackbird Academy and also a long-term uh, recording engineer, producer, I've had recording studios since 1980 writing a book on the history of American recording studios called The Great American Recording Studios. And I do various other things, including forensic audio and all of that. I just wanted to thank Warren for having me on the show. It's a great honor to be here and to get to talk to you. Uh, and I thought that what would be fun to talk about today is uh, just the very basics of equalization with a few interesting little tricks thrown in. Let me show you a little bit about this track and tell you about that. And then we'll actually talk about equalization. Here's, I'll just play a little bit of the track from the beginning. Uh, this is everything other than vocals. And uh, the faders are mostly close to zero uh, and as they were recorded. So here we go. I'm just gonna play some of the drum tracks and we will actually get some equalization here in a second. But let me just show you this. Um, this is a technique that I stole, I mean borrowed, from an amazing producer, engineer, musician here in town named Bobby Holland. Uh, and it's called Front of Kick. Uh, this is an AEA RD4 microphone, kind of their you know, take on an uh, RCA 77, DX77 microphone. Um, and in front of kick, it's over the rim of the resonant head. So at a distance from the drummer pointed at their stomach. Um, and this is the one track that has a compressor on it going in. It's a multi-band compressor. And the trick really is to separate that out. And I can show you some other time. But uh, anyhow, this is uh, one drum mic by itself. This is a little lacking in cymbals uh, because of the figure eight pattern of the microphone. But if we add a little bit of the mono overhead, which I don't remember what it is, I think it's a um, RCA 44, but I don't actually recall because we're at Blackbird and we have uh, microphones. But here's just uh, two microphones front of kick and a, and a mono overhead, just basically right over the center of the kit. Cymbals. And sometime I'd love to come back and tell you about some of my wacky recording techniques, but just um, this is something that I often do. My students are very familiar with it. It's uh, an empty five gallon water bottle in front of the bass drum with uh, a cheap sing uh, small d capsule condenser mic hanging in it. It's about three inches off the bottom, just hanging by its cable. Uh, important point, there's no water in the water bottle. Okay, so you get a five gallon water bottle at a hardware store or whatever, and just hang a mic and stick it right in front. Uh, this is um, on uh, playback. I have a EQ3 one band, which is just set as a low pass filter, very steep at about 120 Hertz. So we're going only for subs. The thing sounds like a basketball without the filter. It sounds like this. So all that boing is not really what we want. But if I take everything out except the subs, you get subs, but you get resonant subs. It's better than a sub kick. So here is the kick in by itself, and then I'll put in the uh, water bottle. If you're listening on laptop speakers, you won't hear the difference because everything that's happening here is uh, below 120 hertz. So let me just show you, this is um, front of kick. 
overhead and water bottle. And then I'll bring in another microphone, which is uh, an Ampex 1101. We call it the Vance mic. It's the Vance Powell microphone that I paid $8 for it on eBay or something like that. But it's a little uh, mic. looks like a bent salt shaker that they used to sell with uh, Ampex reel-to-reel tape machines uh, that's plugged into a rat pedal. Rat pedal is a, it's a guitar distortion pedal that's fantastic on everything except guitar. Uh, it's great on drums and vocals and piano and uh, drum kits and stuff like that. It's, they're pretty good on guitar, but the, the useful thing about it is it has a filter uh, and you can cut out the high end. So this is just um, three microphones and I'll bring in the distortion mic. Three mics. Distortion. Too much distortion. Just distortion and water bottle. So that's a total of about $80 worth of microphones, a five gallon water bottle and a rat pedal. Let's talk about equalization. One of the basic tools that's at, at our disposal, I've already made my, uh, my point for, if possible, trying to record without it and or mix without it. But of course, um, it's a useful tool in our toolkit. And I just want to show you uh, this very simple uh, EQ. Um, it's actually, when I'm mixing, when I need EQ, I actually use the EQ37 band more than others, even though I have a bunch of fancy plugins and so forth. And I think partly it's just out of stubbornness, which I think, you know, uh, a lot of the great records were made with minimal EQ, like two bands of EQ. And I just feel kind of stubborn about it that I just like to be able to do good things with basic tools. You know, uh, somebody said to our students the other day that uh, if somebody showed up to work on their front porch and they had 30 saws and they had 100 screwdrivers, they would sort of trust them less than if they had a few tools that they really knew well. And so I'm, I'm going with that. Now I'm going to tell you how to use an EQ. Turn up stuff you like and turn down stuff you don't like. Okay, well, thanks for coming. No, wait, there's more. Uh, I just want to say some, some general things about it. Um, about equalization in general. So the first rule of recording... It's so very important is that there are no rules. Okay, there's no right or wrong way to do any of this. Uh, and uh, whatever works in some, one situation may not work in another. Uh, so the only time I feel like you're doing it wrong is if you're doing it out of habit or because somebody else told you to do it, including me. Uh, you need to, so the second rule of recording is you have to listen all the time and you have to listen in real time all the time. So don't do things out of habit. Um, personally, I even though I've written a few presets for plugins as favors. I, I'm not a fan of plugins. I don't think that there are recipes or menus. I think it's more creative than that. So you have to really um, have a goal for what you're doing in mixing. Uh, you have to really listen, and then you have to uh, be able to, you know, hear what it needs and then go in and find it. Uh, it's easier to um, just to sort of human nature to add stuff. So you know, I'm going to add this or more low under this or that, or I'm, you know, not hearing the vocal, I need to add more vocal. Uh, it's a good idea to try and train yourself to think subtractively. So if you're not hearing the vocal instead of, oh, I need to EQ it and put a bunch of compression on it, figure out what else might be covering it up or masking it. Uh, keep in mind that the way that our hearing works is that, uh, and this is literally the way that our, our uh, cochleas are put together. It, it, here's a nice word for you, it's tonotopic. Uh, our ears actually separate everything we can hear into octave wide bands. And if you do the math from 20 to 20K, it's 10 octaves. What happens is that when things are in the same octave, they cover each other up, masking. Uh, so it's a good idea to think, try and think subtractively sometimes, which is, you know, I'm not hearing the vocal, what other instruments, you know, guitars, or keyboards, or whatever other vocals, strings, pads, are covering it. And can I either, well, just turn them down, uh, which is the mixing part, or can I EQ them and, and create holes and stratify things where they will each cover different um, parts of it? It's easier for me to think that way because I have synesthesia. So I see sound already, and I have a built-in spectrum analyzer where everything, every frequency is a different color. Uh, that's something we could talk about another time. So you know, it's laid out with colors, not necessarily the right synesthesia colors, but it's laid out. Uh, they call it EQ37 band, but it's really a five band EQ with uh, high pass and low pass filters. The high pass and low pass are up here. Um, I do encourage you to use the high pass filters 
on things um, that don't have a lot of, of uh, low end. Guitars, uh, depending you know, on how heavy you want them to be. I mean, I'm a fan of 50 hertz in, in guitars, but if you're really trying to clear things out so that the bass drum, the 808, the sub, the bass synths, uh, the bass guitar can ac occupy that region, it's a good idea to, to use these things. And generally we'll say, try and figure out what the lowest frequency is that the lowest fundamental of the instrument is in the part that you're doing, and then go an octave down from that. And then I usually go with a fairly steep uh, filter. And one reason this is a good idea is because um, there can be a lot of stuff that in your track that you're not hearing, You've, either you don't have a sub or it's just sub, sub frequency information, uh, that can eat up your headroom. Everything could be struggling to reproduce this, especially in a digital system. You know, it'll, it'll try to reproduce 10 hertz or 15 hertz and it can eat up your headroom. So if your mic's picking up air conditioning noise and footsteps or somebody's tapping their foot or kicking the mic stand, it's, it's a good idea to clean things up in that way. And of course, um, low pass filters, you can, you know, uh, band limit things so they're not eating up too much other stuff, or uh, you can get rid of hiss and that kind of thing. So that's the, the low and high filters. One thing that I will say about EQ in general is that there's a tendency again to always want to boost things. And you need to be a little careful for two reasons. One is watch your gain structure. So if you have an EQ going into a compressor and you think you got the compressor set about right or the limiter set about right, as you add more things with EQ, it's going to push more signal into the compressor. And you may not realize that it's getting more and more squashed. And then later on, you wonder why has it gone lifeless and I've lost my dynamics. So uh, be mindful of your gain structure uh, and look out for distortion, of course. Uh, another point that I like to make is that an equalizer is not a synthesizer. It can only affect what's in the signal, uh, but it's not going to generate signals for you. There are other ways to do that. Um, and that's something that, again, we could talk about another day. You know, uh, I'll just say uh, I'm a big fan of, say, a parallel decapitator to add upper harmonics, which helps you uh, figure out what's going on in low frequencies on things like a laptop that don't have low frequencies. So there's something that I call sweep to find. So, you know, you've, you've listened to your whole recording and you go, okay, there's a problem. And then you zoom in a little bit and you go, okay, what, what is the problem? And my example would be, you know, two instruments are fighting each other in the mid bass and you go, okay, what's the problem? And then you, you zoom in further and you go, okay, it's somewhere in the two to 400 or one to 300 range. And then, you, and it's only happening certain times you go, the floor tom is out of tune with the bass guitar note or something like that. And then you have to decide who's going to win in what frequency, you know, what can I scoop out? What can I uh, change? You know, what are the problem frequencies? And then you can zoom in uh, as much as possible. And one way to do it is the way that people typically do it, which is boost the EQ and then, you know, fairly radically, maybe set the bandwidth a little bit narrower. And then just, you know, sweep through until the thing that you really don't like uh, sticks out. Here are two tricks that I think are kind of cool and I hope you don't already know them. One is if you've swept around and you've located the frequency that you don't like, Let's say it's 220. If you shift click on the gain knob, it reverses the gain. So if you are boosting by a certain amount, it cuts by that amount. So that can be useful. So, you know, generally we can hear things better when we boost them up um, and uh, then try shift clicking. And maybe it's too much and then we can bring it back up a little bit. Um, here's another trick, which again, I hope you don't already know. Uh, if you shift control click on a band and you touch one of the knobs, it will solo that band. So you can solo the, the five bands of the CQ like this. Right, and now we can sweep up and down. We can hear what we're affecting. I know there are other EQs to do this, but I like this because it's, it's uh, it comes with Pro Tools. It's not free, but it comes with Pro Tools. And, uh, you know, you can feel like a pioneer with doing good work with a limited number of tools. So that's a cool trick. I saw that one from Andrew Sheps, name dropping. Paul McCartney told me it's not cool to drop names. A very important point about using um, equalization, which is 
it's useful to solo things to do what we've done here. It's like if you want to identify a, something that you don't like or that might be causing a problem, uh, but try to spend as little time in solo as possible. What really matters is the overall effect and the overall context. And exercise your Zoom, your mental Zoom control, your mental solo uh, Zoom, where you're able to you know, zoom in on different frequencies, um, to go in both directions. It's really easy to sort of get fixated on on something and then end up like where you're staring at the canvas from two inches away. And a lot of people get stuck there. It's really important to be able to, to once you've identified the problem, you think you fixed it, to not then be fixating on, should it be 200 or 212, right? Uh, but to zoom out and go, okay, did that overall fix the problem? And if not, then you dive back in. So um, try to spend as little time in, in solo as possible, I would say. Choices of, of equalization, you know, I think you have to figure out um, what you're trying to do. Are you trying to fix problems, in which case you might be, need something like this where you can get surgical and you can, uh, you know, very precisely pull things out? Or are you looking for musical or, you know, program EQ where we're going for wider bandwidths and we're trying to get more feeling? Um, those are different approaches that may require either different tools or different techniques with something like EQ37 band. Also, um, sometimes, and it's totally valid because we're doing an art, we're using an equalizer not so much as a problem solver, but really just as a flavor. And so if you're using, you know, the EQ3 doesn't really have a flavor, but, uh, you know, we might use a, a, an EQ because it has a certain sound or we like the distortion or, or we just like to look at the graphic interface. And, uh, you know, and the short answer for that is pull tech. You know, pull tech is something, I mean, there's a tradition of that at Power Station and other studios where they would put them in line and not necessarily turn them on just because of the sound of the transformers and the inductors and so on. You know, there are other reasons to use equalizers. And one of them I think is interesting, which is that um, because we're in a world where we're doing a lot of dynamics uh, limiting and we don't have as much room to really get stuff, uh, give st stuff as much dynamics as we'd like to, um, we may not be able to do our basic job as well as we might otherwise. And our basic job is to keep people interested and to pull them in and to engage them. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that dynamics does, but we really are in a, in a world, especially with pop music and certain kinds of music where we don't have the latitude to really get quiet and loud the way you might in classical music or jazz. So we have to look for other ways to do it. You know, how do we make the, the world open up when we get to a chorus? How do we engage somebody or excite them? And one way to do that is um, by opening up the frequency spectrum. So we can use, we can give the impression of dynamics with EQs. And uh, we can do that by um, automating them or, or, you know, flipping between, we can have the verse guitar and the chorus guitar, something like that. Um, and just the idea that when the, when the high end opens or sparkles or the, the acoustic guitar suddenly gets brighter, you do get that kind of feeling of, of lift without things necessarily getting louder. So there are a couple of ways to do it. I mean, one way is to automate it. Another way, as I implied, is just to make a copy, you know, um, just duplicate the track and then just mute everything that's not the verse in the verse version of whatever the instrument is or voice, and then have another complete set of things in, in courses. It's a, a, in a way we're trying to simulate the way that records were made uh, before automation, where you would mix a verse or a chorus, and then you would uh, splice them together. And there would be these sudden scene changes in things. And that's very stimulating, exciting. And it's, it's a, a little bit harder to do in the digital world, where it's you're easier to sort of get one setting and just bounce it and have it just go that way all the way through. And um, that can tend to be uninteresting and our job is not to bore people. One of the things that's nice about these, uh, this EQ37 band is that it, you can get easy access to the automation because it's an Avid plugin. Uh, you can go into the, um, the automation window and choose what you're gonna automate and all that sort of thing. Uh, but there's an easier way. We have something we call Boy Scout like the, uh, the Boy Scout salute, which is control, option, command. It's all three of the modifier keys. And in that case, you can click on any of the, uh, of the knobs on here or any of the controls. Or if you want to, you can just click here where, where the automation symbol is. And it will say, it will ask you if you want to uh, automate it. So let's say we want to automate the gain control on the top end. And I'm, so I'm just holding control option command, clicking on it and says, do you want to enable it? Yes, I do. Green light comes on, ready to go. What we may want to do would be to just like I said, automate that where, you know, we can just go in and, and automate it and or draw it. 
um, so that it opens up, say, in, in certain sections. Uh, I'll just do that at random for uh, a second here. So we'll just go to the track itself, put its automation in write mode, and play it. I'm going to unsolo it. Here comes the vocal. I'm going to pull it down a little bit. I'm darkening it to leave a little room for the vocal. And then I'm going to boost it when we get to the chorus, just so the world will get a little brighter. Here we go. Here's another trick which you may know, and if you and I hope you don't, but it's kind of cool. I think of control and command as being this. I see you, right? And so if you control, we just automated this thing, uh, the, the, the gain on the top end of the CQ. If you control command click on it, in the window, in the edit window, it takes you right to that automation information. And now you can see what you just did. So I'm gonna zoom in by hitting the letter T, and there it is, and we can manipulate it and change it and so forth. Um, it's a good way of not, you know, going in, editing it, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, actually I was panning it, or that was the volume automation, not the, the high end. Uh, so that's fun. Here's something else that I do with EQ um, fairly often. It's um, especially when I'm dealing with something that has a drum machine, and especially if it's a drum machine that has some human players along with it. Um, you know, we'll, obviously we'll do a lot of editing to make the, the players conform more to the drums, that kind of thing, but sometimes you want to go the other direction and make a drum machine feel more organic and feel a little bit more like it was played by a drummer. Uh, so, you, you know, a typical culprit for me is a 16th note drum machine hi-hat. You know, every note sounds exactly the same. They're all exactly at the same level. And it, it lacks interest to me. You know, again, from a synesthetic point of view, it's monochrome. It's the same color all the time. And, you know, you want to give it a little bit of swing. You want to give it a little bit of changes. What's going to happen with an actual drummer who's playing? They're not always going to hit the hi-hat in the exact same spot with the exact same angle on the stick at the exact same velocity, right? Um, they're going to hit it at different places. Uh, their volume might come up and down. Um, and so one of the things that I'll do is go to the uh, pencil tool. And you can do different things like this, like you can actually make it happen rhythmically according to your grid where it gets louder and softer. But uh, what I'll sometimes do is I'll just go to the random tool. So it's command and six on the, uh, on the alphabetical side, the command and number six. And you can literally, it, this will go depending on how your grid is set. And of course, as I said, we're not to a, a click here. But even just here, there's the, well, this is the front of kick, but uh, you can do something like this, where it just randomly opens the, the, high, the high end of the track up and down. And sometimes that just helps to give it a little bit more variation and interest. And I'll do the same thing, by the way, for the automation uh, of a, uh, on a panner. So, you know, our job as a mixer is to shine a spotlight around and you know, enhance and, and light different things so that there's always something of interest in the mix. Uh, and so if I want to call somebody's attention, say, to something, or, you know, draw, yeah, if I just want to draw their attention to something, there are different ways you could do it. I mean, one is the obvious way is make it louder. You know, the way that our hearing works, fundamentally, even though we use it for rarefied things like listening to music, it's really based on um, the our ability to protect ourselves, right? Uh, it's really there to alert us to danger and that kind of thing. It's, that's what it's all based on. So the things that draw our attention are fairly basic. Like if something's getting louder, it's coming towards us. So that's going to call our attention to it. But also, even if you're in a fairly noisy room, if there's something quiet that's moving, it will draw your attention, right? If there's something rustling in the corner, you're going to realize it because our hearing is there to protect us from, you know, being snuck up on. Uh, so... I, I will tend to automate a panner if I want to draw attention to something. So let's say we have a shaker in the, in the track. If it just sits in one place, 
your brain is going to dismiss it just the way it dismisses like the wall covering around the room in which you're sitting. Your brain filters out stuff that isn't meaningful. Uh, but you can just automate a little panner. And if it's moving back and forth, especially randomly, not predictably, um, it will call your attention to it. And you can actually have it pretty quiet in the mix, but your brain will, will find that. So I uh, hope that wasn't too obscure. Here's something else that I came up with the other day. Uh, there are actually plugins that will do this for you, but if you don't have those plugins or you just feel like doing it yourself, this is uh, something that works fairly variably, so it, your, your results may vary, but it actually worked kind of interestingly in, on this track. Um, and it's a method of making your own resonant filter with EQ1, which again comes with Pro Tools. So this works partly on this because I did the water bottle trick that I told you about earlier, empty five gallon water bottle in front of bass drum, microphone hanging down. Uh, it's got a low pass filter on it, about 120 Hertz. Uh, it makes your acoustic bass drum sound like an 808. This is my, one of my uh, evangelisms. I'm trying to get everybody to do this. So give it a try and I hope it works. Uh, anyhow, um, so I already have a resonant thing that I'm sending into this filter, but let me show you this trick. It's, uh, you can do this in Filter Freak, okay, because it has a knob that says resonant. Up here on the send, I'm sending the bass drum out on bus seven. And bus seven is feeding an aux input track, mono, uh, that has a low pass filter on it. So in other words, I'm feeding the bass drum to an aux track. It's got only uh, the lowest octaves below 90. So by the way, you should listen to this on headphones or if you have a sub, that's that works. But if you're listening on a laptop, um, this won't make any sense. Uh, but if you're trying to make, again, if you want trying to make a bass drum sound like an 808, this is a pretty cool trick, I think. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, here's the bass drum uh, in and um, water bottle by themselves. That already has some resonance. I'm going to bring up the uh, the reson the uh, this other resonant one, which doesn't make much difference. As you know, if you option click on a fader, it goes to zero. Okay, if I turn up a lot, you know, you get some more resonance. But here's the trick. I'm making it a self-resonant uh, EQ or filter. So the filter is being fed by a bus, in this case, number seven. And what I'm doing is I'm feeding it back to itself, right? I, uh, so I have... On this thing's being fed by bus seven, I am sending to bus seven. If I feed it, if I feed back too much, it will do this, which is lovely. Uh, but that's not really what we want. Uh, so I'm just going to slowly bring this up and uh, and see what happens. It gets cool about minus five. Feel that? No self-resonating filter. Self-resonating filter. Turn it down a little. Let's mute it and put the rest of the band in. Now I'm gonna turn it on. That's kind of cool, huh? Uh, and there's one other trick, which is interesting, I think, which is if you invert the polarity, so as it's feeding back, each time it comes in, it's coming out, it's coming, each time it uh, recir recycles through, it's coming in upside down, it's gonna make the resonance uh, an octave higher. Here we go. Well, it's kind of minor third. Uh, 
again, you won't hear this unless you're listening on something that has subs, but again, this is inverted. So you can actually uh, change that. And I, I think, um, especially with headphones and sub, uh, you will feel this. I'm just gonna show you a little bit more of it and then we're gonna wrap it up. music. <laughs> it's the best. Uh, I was just going to show you some, uh, just a few other things. Um, if you notice, this is um, take one of three. We're not using the other two. And if you also notice everything that I've been playing back, which like I said, I track almost no EQ, you know, I don't mean to brag, but what the hell. Um, the, uh, but if you notice also, there's no volume automation on anything. This is all the tracks are, are just playing straight. So when the guitar solo gets louder, it's because the guitarist played louder. And, uh, you know, they're balancing themselves just because they're, they're so good. Um, and as you know, if you hold down Option and you hit the minus key on your alphabetical keyboard, it allows you to flip back and forth between seeing your volumes and your waveforms. Um, and, or, or, you know, you can do that with, uh, with just whatever the individual selected tracks are. Here's, here's another very minor uh, shortcut, but it's kind of interesting. When you're EQing stuff, there's a tendency just to always feel like it's better because A, it's louder. And you know you can do that with a, a fader and then not have to worry about phase shift and other problems. Um, so it's a good idea to level match things. Uh, but there's something that, that I recommend doing, which is when you've EQed stuff, uh, select all the tracks or whatever tracks you have EQ on. And if you hold down shift and you hit E for EQ, it bypasses all of your equalizers. And that way you can tell if you're doing harm uh, or improving things. And again, it's, you know, um, as John McBride says, loudness always wins. Uh, and so it's, it's easy to deceive oneself just because you turn up the bass, you turn up the mid-range, you turn up the treble and you go, oh, listen how it jumps out. You could have just pushed the fader up 3 dB and probably done less harm. So uh, there are some ideas and some tips and tricks, I guess you might call them. Uh, I, hope, I hope that they're useful for you. And I just want to thank Warren and everybody at Produce Like a Pro for letting me come on and babble at you. It's um, a true honor. And uh, come and visit us in Nashville. Hope you're all well and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.